Hi, I'm Margaret Gam, Director of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. I would also like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations, the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Ho-Chunk Nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. To help you start your own exploration of these histories of Iowa and its people, we encourage you to take a look at the links provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. So tonight's speakers join us from across the University of Iowa. Dr. Eric Ensley, the first speaker, is curator of rare books and maps here in Special Collections and Archives. Eric is the general of the Bibliographical Society of America's newly relaunched BibSite project to freely share digital materials on the study of books. Giselle Simone is university conservator at the University of Iowa Libraries and adjunct faculty at the UI Center for the Book. She is also co-director for Paper and Book Intensive, a working sabbatical for paper and book practitioners. Dr. Eric Hoffman is professor of radiology, medicine, and biomedical engineering at UI. He is the director of the Advanced Pulmonary Physiomic Imaging Laboratory in the Department of Radiology and the director of the Iowa Comprehensive Imaging Center at the UI. Susan Walsh is director of Small, imaging, Small Animal Imaging Corp, where she provides technical expertise for molecular <clears throat> imaging research projects, protocol development and implementation and image analysis. Some of her areas are, of research are cardiology, multiple myeloma, cystic fibrosis, and material science. Thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, welcome first of all to Eric Ensley. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you all for being here tonight at Bibliophiles. Uh, it's always nice to see all of you, and I'm going to lead us off uh, pretty generally to start and let some of the others speak in a in a more granular way about some of the things we'll be talking about uh, with our project that we've been working on. I'll start by saying, um, first off, that our, we are the Iowa Initiative for Scientific Imaging and Conservation of Cultural Artifacts, ISICA. Um, that's a mouthful. But we are a group from across the university of scientists, humanists, um, engineers, various people like that who are working towards humanistic goals in a variety of areas. So this project is just one prong of a much broader group of projects, um, but we're very proud of this one and are excited to talk to you about it tonight. And uh, so just to get started, I'm going to start very broadly and say what we're doing here. Why have I put up a picture of, I believe that's one of us, I'm not sure who it was, pointing at a group of books going into a CT scanner across the river at the medical campus. So to speak very bluntly, uh, we're using, in this case, an x-ray machine to see if we can see inside books and read through their covers. Good night. No. Um, so to basically get started, why would we want to do that? Um, and I think that's the first place we want to go is what is the problem we're addressing with our project? So essentially, when we think of old books today, we tend to think of them as very uh, valuable and treasured artifacts that we want to preserve and take care of uh, in universities and climate controlled conditions and things like that. That was not always the case. If we go back far enough, uh, books, especially books that might have been hundreds of years old for somebody in the 16th century, for example, they were utilitarian objects. They were meant to carry text, uh, and you might go about destroying one of them to make a newer book. So to basically say what we are doing is looking for what are called binding fragments in this project. A binding fragment is when you take a medieval, typically a medieval manuscript, on parchment or vellum, so on animal skin, and you would shred that in the 1500s or the 1600s primarily to buttress the binding of a book. You can see a couple of pictures here that show binding fragments used to secure the bindings of books that probably are about a 200 to 100 years older than the medieval fragments that are used to buttress them. So, you know, they're looking back two, 300 years in some cases and thinking, well, I have a book that's more valuable to me now. I'll use these binding fragments to help reinforce them and keep them secure. Essentially, 
they were using what was available to them, um, especially in places like England after the dissolution of the monasteries, when the monasteries were broken down by King Henry VIII, manuscripts flooded out of those, and those could be shredded and put into newly printed books and help to reinforce them. Generally, uh, where would we find manuscript ways? Well, as you can see from these photos, there are a couple of places we typically find them in books. They're usually found in the gutter. So you can see that on the right-hand image where it's down in the crease between the binding and the, and the page, or you might see them between pages as well. They can also be used as paste downs, which is our fly leaves, which are on the left-hand side over there. So they might've been pasted down against the boards of the book or they might have been used as kind of decorative end papers sometimes, as we see. Now, there have been some really cool finds. You might say, we might say, well, what kind of books were they breaking down? You know, utilitarian objects sometimes, sometimes they would use commentaries on biblical texts, uh, prayers. Um, sometimes it would be legal documents they would break down for this purpose. But sometimes they broke down books that we don't know much about today. And that's where these two images come in. Um, two of the biggest finds in binding fragments recently were a uh, copy of a epic story called The Sieged Orange, a uh, French epic text that we knew existed or we thought we knew existed because of references to it in other texts. So people said, oh, you know, in this text, they say this, um, but we never saw a copy of it. That led some scholars to doubt that maybe the book never even existed. Maybe it was this fiction that was made up. But then Tamara Atkins, um, who is a scholar from Oxford University, actually found this leaf on the left-hand side is a copy of the Siege d'Orange. It's only one leaf. It's not the entire thing. But it actually changed our understanding of this text. We know now that it existed. So that's pretty exciting. The other one on the right is um, a discovery by a team from Bristol Library, also in the UK, who found a new exemplar of a tale of Merlin from King Arthur that we didn't know existed either. So, you know, binding fragments, these are two really grand showcase uh, type of thing that if we found these, we'd be ecstatic, we'd be in the news for it. And a lot of times it'll be things like Bible fragments, um, which are a little less exciting, but everybody kind of hopes for the jackpot. Um, still, though, we can learn a lot from even the mundane fragments. We can learn about handwriting. We can learn about materials from earlier periods. Um, and the exciting thing about binding fragments, I think, is that every library just about, every special collections unit will have some somewhere. Um, an estimate says that maybe one in five early modern printed books contains a medieval fragment in it. That's pretty exciting. Um, you can go to a small college library and perhaps it doesn't have any medieval manuscripts and you can say, no, you probably do have a medieval manuscript. It's hidden somewhere in this collection. Um, so a lot of people have become invested in finding these fragments and cataloging them in hopes of finding new texts and learning more about the Middle Ages and earlier periods. Now, uh, so we'll come to our work in a moment, but I want to kind of set the stage for the field that we're talking about. Why would we care about reading through a binding? Okay, so sometimes we can see the medieval fragments plainly, as in the last two examples. We didn't have to open up any bindings or anything like that. However, sometimes the binding fragments are found on the spine and covered by bindings that are themselves cultural artifacts that we do not want to destroy by removing them from the book. On the right-hand side, you can see this really well illustrated in an image uh, that Eric Quackle, who I believe is at the University of British Columbia uh, at Victoria, is uh, working on now and has published on in the past. But you can see this fragment is underneath the parchment binding of this book. Um, he did not want to remove the parchment fragment because it is part of the book, and we aim to not destroy artifacts when we research them. So... Quackle and his team sought to figure out how can we read through the bindings to see what texts lie beneath them. And what they came up with was using a macro XRF scanner, which is an X-ray scanner that is aimed at a book for quite a long time. Um, Quackle scans took between six and eight hours, I believe, um, five, six, seven, eight hours. It was measured in hours that they had to aim this X-ray at this book to see through that binding to get the image you see on the right. And you can see the medieval text coming through the binding there. Um, so the as Quackle and his team note that the 
Production was non-invasive. It allowed the team to easily read the medieval fragments contained within the 16th century book. Um, however, there are limitations, and I believe that Giselle will talk a little bit more about some of the limitations of using X-ray on some of these books. Um, yeah, this was still a very important step. It was one of the first times that we were able to read a medieval binding fragment through a binding using uh, X-ray imaging technology. And we'll come back to this uh, in a few minutes too as well. So as Quackle and others are doing this, this comes at a moment when we're really getting interested in binding fragments around the world. As I said, it's kind of exciting because every almost every university will have medieval binding fragments in it. It's a way to bring together groups of people across universities. Of course, large universities with large medieval holdings and early modern holdings will have the greatest numbers, but like the Bodleian, Yale, Harvard, institutions like that. But of course, smaller institutions have a say in this as well. And you never know where the next Merlin fragment is going to be hanging out. You know, it could be up at Cornell College for all we know. Um, and that's kind of an exciting prospect, a thing that professors at various institutions around the globe can participate in. I just wanted to point out this example of um, interest out there. This is the Fragmentarium. It's a project where institutions can submit their own fragments to a digital repository with images. Um, and it, their goal is to actually piece together some books. Um, one of their best test cases is that there was a famous broken manuscript um, that they have reassembled almost in total from institutions around the world. Over 20 institutions have submitted images of this manuscript, and they've managed to piece it back together and reconstitute it after it was broken up. So in a way, we're kind of doing a restorative archaeology as well. And that brings me to our test case, uh, which this is really kind of fun stuff that we're working on, but it also has a, a promises to have an impact on the field. So one of the problems that we noted with Quackle is that his x-ray scanning technology takes upwards four, five, six hours to look at a single binding fragment. It's cost intensive. It takes time. You're not going to move through a collection very fast with that. Our question that we came up with was, what if we use some newer CT scanning technology to try to look at the interior of these books to see if there are binding fragments in them and do it in a more fast clip? Uh, so one of the more interesting things I will say to come to light is that, well, okay, so new CT scanning technology allows us to basically hopefully get inside a book more easily. A CT scan can take upwards of less than a minute, whereas uh, Quackle's work was taking four to six, five, six hours. So what we were looking for was a test case. You can see in the upper left photo, we have a three very big books there. Um, I can attest that they are very heavy. Giselle can attest they are very heavy as she dragged them through the subterranean corridors of the hospital to get them to the scanning room. And that was quite the feat. Um, but this is a three volume copy of Conrad Gessner's Animalium, uh, Historia Animalium from 1551 to 1587. So this is a kind of bestiary, a book of beasts and um, what they were, kind of an early scientific encyclopedia of animals. And our copy has been bound by the same binder, all three copies. And in one of those copies, the skin of the book, the, the parchment, the leather binding on it has begun to pull back such that, and that's, you can see that in the bottom left photo. And we noted that inside of this volume are some very old binding fragments. Uh, we are talking 11th century binding fragments, maybe around 1100. That's very early to find binding fragments from. And they're just plastered on there. They're very clear to read. And that got us thinking, so if this binder bound those with uh, those binding fragments, maybe he bound the other two as well, and we have a control uh, substrate there. So we, can, we know what's underneath it. We can scan through it to see if we can read that. And then we can test to see if we can read the other two volumes as well. So uh, Eric Hoffman was kind enough to uh, let us use a CT scanner across the river over there. And we popped it in. And with the assistance of Hong Hai Zheng, who couldn't be with us tonight, um, who pulled uh, some of the details out uh, with a, a algorithm, we were able to look inside of the binding and pull out the images that you see on the screen here. Now, 
as you can see, it's not perfectly legible. Um, some of them are, sorry, I'm moving my screen around here. And you can see that the uh, ink on the page has fluoresced under the CT scanner in some cases. And that's part of the thing we're working on right now is to see how do we get the rest of the ink to fluoresce if we can do so. But one of our most exciting findings is on the upper right hand side where we were actually able to read the text through the binding via a CT scan. Um, and uh, Catherine Takau, who also couldn't be with us tonight, I believe, unless, no. So uh, we were able to figure out that this says likely uh, hic, hic incipit vita sancti mari something, and then EPI, which is likely episcopus. So here begins the life of Saint so-and-so bishop. That's a really exciting thing because that scan took less than a minute. Um, I believe Eric Hoffman, you described this as easy at one point, which thrilled me. And it promises a future perhaps where you could load up books into a CT scanner, see what binding fragments are in them, and maybe perhaps not read them legibly immediately, but see where you want to concentrate your effort um, if there are any interesting texts, uh, things like that within your collection. So I've droned on a little bit long. Um, I will turn it over now to Giselle, who I believe will talk about some of the conservation issues that go into a project like this. And I look forward to your questions later. Great. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. And maybe you, I'm going to ask you just to advance the, to the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit broad, more broadly about the process that we've gone through and all the, the good technical juicy bits can be uh, directed to Eric Hoffman and Susan Walsh. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, so as the um, as the conservator, you can see that uh, I'm responsible for the care and handling of these large wooden board bindings. And in this uh, slide, you can see that um, Eric and I are working with Jaron uh, one of um, Eric Hoffman's staff to unpack and place the um, the bindings on the human CT scanner. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about this process. Um, as Eric Ensley has just pointed out, scholars are starting to use various imaging techniques to reveal information and answer specific questions. Um, Susan, Ho Susan Walsh told me that that's one of the most important things that we do is ask the right question or even ask a question so that the, the scientists can help us figure out the answer. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, the idea of using scientific methods to give us specific evidence about things like age or chemical makeup of an object or material goes back to techniques such as radiocarbon dating um, beginning in the late 1940s. There are also biological techniques used like DNA testing and analytical techniques like X-ray fluorescence and UV examination, so ultraviolet examination. Um, these tell us things about elemental and molecular makeup of materials. But right now, I wanted to point out that we're gonna be talking, we're focusing on imaging techniques and specifically tomography or X-radiography most commonly known as CT scanning, as we've mentioned already, computerized tomography. All these techniques use images, data collected, to tell us information about materials that we're looking at. All of these different types of technical, technological tools continue to evolve and develop, especially as humanities fields begin working with scientists more and more. Um, it's critical that we have the experts, the scientists, involved in not only interpreting the data that we harvest, but also in helping us choose the best imaging tools to find the answers. I certainly could not do this on my own. Um, one of the drivers for all of us was the notion that we're using equipment and techniques that we also have available on campus and investigate how they would help us answer our questions. So what do we have here in our own backyard that we can use? And, and Eric Ensley touched on this a little bit already. Um, conservators are interested in using these techniques to inform treatment decisions. And if we know the chemical makeup, we can bet, be better informed about our decisions, about what materials we need to use in repairing items. We can also understand what exactly is causing damage or determine the best long-term storage needs of an object, whether it's a book or a painting. So it's really about knowing the facts about the physicality 
of an object to help make decisions. Um, it's been re a real learning process for sure, um, especially for me. <laughs> and I'll of course never be an expert in, in CT scanning. So the collaboration here with our colleagues is absolutely critical. Um, and shortly, Eric Hoffman is gonna speak about the CT scanning process. Um, and definitely ask Susan Walsh questions as well. Um, so uh, Eric, next slide, please. Um, so aside from wondering about the chemical makeup of things, my main gig is to ensure that our collection materials are safe and cared for during the imaging process. Um, so here we see um, Eric and I, and, and also Eric Hoffman and his staff, his staff person again, Jaren, helping us to position books on the CT scanning bed. Um, sometimes this gets overlooked, mainly because it's just about being practical about pre preserving our collections, um, keeping them in a secure environment that is appropriate for their makeup. Like Eric mentioned, these are parchment covered bindings uh, with wooden boards. So we want to be very careful about the, the fluctuations of temperature and humidity that we're taking these things in and out of. Um, uh, and we're also not just tossing these things into our backpacks and trekking over to radiology. Um, that's sort of a no-brainer, um, but again, it, uh, we don't really think about it. Um, I'm responsible again for packing these things and overseeing them during the imaging process. So um, as Eric alluded to, um, these were packed up in a Pelican case, like a Halliburton case, and um, thankfully it had wheels. And we were able to transport it through um, first uh, through through our vehicle and then through the um, labyrinth of uh, tunnels underneath the hospital so that we could get to uh, Eric's uh, radi uh, radiology lab uh, safely. Uh, so that was fun. Um, uh, here we have our first scanning session with Eric Hoffman and his human sized CT scanner. Eric Ensley and I are positioning the wooden boards bindings on the scanner bed and Eric Hoffman can camp can again comment more on how the scanner um, images our objects, but as you know, it gathers data that can be interpreted as slices of the object, and those slices are then stacked back together by the computer. Um, you can see um, our futons or our supports, our pillows for our books on the scanner bed. And um, going into this, I wasn't sure how Eric Hoffman wanted us to prop books up for the scanner, but thankfully, um, as he said, it was easy and they just lay flat on the scanner bed and the scanner does all the hard work of separating all the materials um, that we find here. Um, Eric, next slide, please. And finally, we see the packing up of the books. So they, they go back into their own specific boxes and then back into our Pelican case. Uh, to take back to the library. Um, and next slide, please. Um, here we have just another view. This is the very first uh, uh, image that came up on the screen at, at this scanning session. So we were super excited to even see just this faint uh, little bit of text. And um, in Eric's Entley slide, you can see that it was much more pronounced, but here it was great to just see it automatically. So we were all really very excited. Um, and next slide, please. I wanted to mention, in addition to um, the tomography, another imaging technique that we're looking at is multispectral imaging, which is not a new idea in the area of cultur cultural heritage or scholarly research. Um, cultural, I'm sorry, cultural, cultural heritage preservation or scholarly research. Multispectral imaging is another method that captures image data by focusing on specific wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum. The wavelengths can be separated out so we can see frequencies beyond visible light, like infrared and ultraviolet. So we can see things that are invisible to the naked eye through different filters in this process. Again, giving us more information about the makeup of objects, and in this case, paint or ink on manuscript pages. So here are some paint samples that we've been working with. And uh, we're using medieval uh, methods to make these paints. Um, thanks to paint and pigment expert, Cheryl Porter, a conservator who has done extensive research on medieval pigments and how they were made. Um, and she's in the UK. 
um, we're using these samples as known quantities as we test the equipment that we that we're using in Susan Walsh's lab. Um, they can be flat, but we're, we've also created mounts or fixtures that can be placed in the multispectral imaging equipment and, and the CT scanner. So we can do them in both. Um, again, the scanner can image many things at once and does not need to be flat. And the CT scanner that Susan has in her lab is a micro scanner, and she can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, so it focuses on a very small part of the sample. Um, finally, um, let's see, actually, sorry, Eric, can you, next slide. Um, finally, in an actual manuscript leaf, so we are going to be looking at some manuscript leaves from our collection. This is one from Special Collections, the Otto Aggie Collection. Um, and here I've created a mount that can be used in CT scanning and, and also placed in the MSI equipment for multispectral imaging. And we'll use it for, again for both of the, we'll use both of these message methods for these manuscript leaves. Um, so here we've got a, um, a manuscript leaf um, that we did not take away from, from an actual book, but it's a collection of leaves. Um, this is a Paris Bible um, from 1310. And you can see here that I've, I've made an encasement with a polyester sheeting. And there's a little piece of um, museum board or rag board um, that uh, keeps it um, basically as a, again, as a little encasement um, so that the, the manuscript leaf is kept very secure and sound. Um, it can be handled um, and easily by the technicians putting, uh, putting the manuscript leaf in and out of the scanning, uh, the scanners, um, but also it can survive, it, it, it can survive that, that trip back and forth um, in and out of the lab um, and keeps it, um, it basically in its own little micro, supportive microclimate. Um, so these are really helpful because we can position the, the little fixture or mount up or down or however it needs to be in any of the equipment that we're using. So thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to Eric Hoffman. I'm going to talk a little bit about the X-ray technology that's behind um, uh, the exploration of the books. Uh, uh, my background is I'm a, a, a PhD in physiology. I concentrate on studying the lung and primarily I uh, use X-ray CT uh, to do that. The, uh, this is just an opening slide to remind us that X-ray has been around since uh, 1895 uh, when uh, uh, Rentgen uh, stumbled on uh, the property, X-ray properties and made this first image of his wife's hand uh, wearing her wedding ring. But it wasn't until 19, uh, the early 1970s that Sir Godfrey Hounsfield uh, began in the basement of Emmy Corporation, Electrical Musical Instrument Corporation, which was the corporation that published the early Beatles uh, music. Then in the basement of Emmy, that uh, uh, Hounsfield developed what's become known as uh, computed uh, tomography. He discovered that if you shoot x-ray and gather the projections of a given object from multiple angles of view, you can solve a series of equations that uh, really represent how much every piece of the structure you're scanning is, is attenuating the photons going through the body. So you think of it as a matrix of structures individually attenuating the photons and those attenuations are linear so that they add up to a certain value in any given projection. And then you have simultaneous equations to solve all of those attenuations. So you end up getting a slice of the body. And he was interested in imaging uh, a single slice of the dead brain to start with. So he could take quite a while to do his imaging uh, he, he originally used a, a gamma 
uh, ray source rather than x-rays. And it took nine days to collect uh, the uh, projections and two and a half hours to reconstruct it. And then two and a half hour, two hours just to display uh, the resultant image. But once it was uh, prototyped into a clinical scanner, uh, he moved it to Atkinson uh, Morley Hospital in England. And uh, uh, the first scans were obtained taking five minutes uh, for a single slice. And subsequently, the first uh, working version of the brain scanner got a slice in 18, uh, 18 uh, seconds. Meanwhile, at the same, during the same time period, a group that I was in at the Mayo Clinic was seeking to image the beating heart and the breathing lungs. So hours or even minutes was not fast enough uh, to gather the images. So he developed a system of uh, 14 X-ray guns in semicircle aimed at a hemicylindrical fluorescent screen looked at by a bank of television cameras that get 240 TV lines worth of projections uh, every 60th of a second. And we were able to then, therefore, every second capture uh, a stack of slices uh, through the body. And the recognition that these slices were volumet, you had a volumetric data set rather than a flat single slice uh, created a new name uh, for what Hounsfield called the pixel. Uh, we ended up recognizing this as a volume element known as the voxel. And these voxels, again, represent the attenuation of that particular piece of tissue uh, in terms of how much it's blocking those photons from going all the way through the body and creating a projection image on the other side. So I just here uh, show the progression of the CT scanner, the volumetric dynamic uh, nature of volumetric CT uh, from the first release of the dynamic spatial reconstructor in 1979 to in 1983, there was a scanner known as the Imatron uh, Cine CT scanner that had no moving parts, that it had a, uh, a tungsten target that directed an electron beam. Uh, uh, well, the electron beam was directed onto a hemicylindrical tungsten target that then served to shoot photons along a hemicylindrical detector. And you can move an electron beam a lot faster than you can spin 14 X-ray tubes. Uh, so this scanner was able to capture enough projections to create a beating image of the heart and breathing lungs and the passage of contrast agent. And then uh, uh, with the idea that uh, uh, volumetric imaging was more was of critical importance to understand the structure of the body, that the manufacturers started increasing the number of slices that a conventional CT scanner was able to capture. And it went from eight slices to 16 slices to 64 slices, and now up to over 300 slices uh, with the rotation of a scanner. And the rotation has gotten to the point where it can rotate once every 0.2 seconds. Uh, so, so with a spiral scan, you send the images, the patient through the scanner as it's rotating around, you capture a spiral of projections, interpolate them into a stack of uh, consistent uh, adjacent sections, and then create a volumetric image of the body. But in 2006, with the interest in separating various specific materials out into a three-dimensional image, say you inject iodine to look at blood flow, 
or you inhale xenon gas to look at ventilation or you inject gadolinium. There's any number of contrast agents uh, that you can use. Dual energy CT was developed whereby if you scan the body simultaneously at two different kilovoltages, the attenuation of substances such as iodine or xenon or gadolinium or gold uh, will change those substances will react differently to those two different kilovoltages than the normal body tissue, such that at the two kilovoltages, the grayscale of those substances are shifted, whereas the normal body tissues are not shifted in terms of grayscale. So you essentially can subtract one picture from the other and the normal body tissues will just go away because they weren't shifted in terms of their brightness. And then those compounds that you injected uh, do show a variable differences between the two different kilovoltages. Now with just two different uh, X-ray guns or kilovoltages, uh, you can separate out two materials. Uh, and we use such as uh, lung tissue, uh, which is basically water and iodine, or lung tissue and xenon uh, for ventilation. And then in 2013, uh, a new version of the dual energy CT scanner was developed that I won't go into the great detail of, but it doubled the spatial resolution. It brought the radiation dose down by nearly tenfold. Uh, to where you can get these dynamic volumetric material uh, reconstructions in on the order of a, one second and with radiation dose on the order of a pair of chest films. So here you see uh, the grayscale image of a few slices of the chest. Iodine has been injected. And with material decomposition from the two kilovoltages, you can pull out the iodine. And so in this experiment, we blew up a balloon into uh, one of the arteries of the uh, lung so that we variably closed off blood flow to that region of the lung and verified that with the dual energy, we could identify very specifically uh, where that balloon went and how much of the lung perfusion it was blocking off. Similarly, with inhaled xenon gas, you can identify how much ventilation is going to a particular part of the lung. And you can see that there's more heterogeneous ventilation in a smoker than a non-smoker. So we use these to explore different physiological properties. But now in the last year, uh, photon counting CT has emerged. And the difference between the CT that I've been talking about to date and photon counting uh, CT is in the detector. Uh, the conventional CT scanners to date integrate the photons on a detector. And the more photons that hit that detector, the brighter it gets. And then there's a conversion of that brightness into an electrical signal that then is used in the reconstruction process. And two things, you don't know what the uh, energies of those photons are that went through the body. And you, uh, the conversion to electrical signal from the brightness, uh, the analog signal, uh, creates a lot of noise in the image. So photon counting is, is a uh, method whereby the detector is a semiconductor that it senses every photon that hits it and not only counts the photon, but can bin it into the specific energies of those photons. And so the X-ray we use, we think of it as being 70 kilovolts or 150 kilovolts, but really it's a, a spectra so that it's a range of kilovoltages, and that also causes uh, some degradation of the image. 
Whereas here, if you know exactly how many photons of what kilovoltage hit that semiconductor, uh, that you now can be much more specific in your reconstruction of materials. And because you can bin these uh, in a single scan, you can get multiple bins of ranges of uh, photon energies. You can pull apart more than one material. So if you have, in the context of the book, if you have multiple elements that are making up a given ink, uh, you can possibly separate one ink type from another ink type by characterizing the materials that are um, that it's made up of. Just to show you the increased spatial resolution of the photon counting CT, you can see the exquisite detail available of the pulmonary vascular bed uh, with photon counting CT. And you can see the microstructure, uh, the trabeculations uh, in the center of uh, the bones. So the spatial resolution is down to about 0.2 uh, millimeters, about or 200 microns. And we won't get into great detail, but in addition to the scanners that I've been talking about is a micro CT scanner that uh, uh, Susan Walsh uh, runs uh, over in the small animal facility. And she can answer questions about that, but we can get samples uh, smaller samples scanned similar to CT scanning and then reconstruct down to one to two micron resolution. And here you see it's allowing us to image the terminal uh, acinus, uh, the gas exchange region of the lung. So because these structures are three-dimensional and the same with a book where the pages are not perfectly flat, uh, that if you pull out a slice uh, through the object, you only crisscross uh, the various pieces of the object. And we use a method of reconstructing the three-dimensional uh, structure of the airway tree, as you see here. But if you wish to interrelate that, for instance, to the surrounding parenchyma, uh, we've developed a method that allows us to project uh, uh, the three-dimensional structure into a single plane. So here you see all of the uh, airway tree projected into a single plane and the parenchyma has been brought in with it so that this was a patient that had COVID and you can see this particular airway structure is the one that's feeding uh, that COVID uh, region. So we can begin to understand the delivery, selective delivery and routes of delivery of inhaled particulate, for instance. So we've taken these uh, methods that we've developed for the lung and employed them uh, to evaluate these books that you've been hearing about. So I won't go into the details, but I put these up here just to show that we have available, if anybody is interested, uh, the exact uh, uh, protocols that we use to image the book so far. So far, again, it's been using dual energy CT. Uh, we just received uh, on the clinical side of the radiology department, one of the country's first photon counting uh, CT scanners, and we'll be developing uh, protocols specifically uh, to look at a bunch of inks uh, that, that have been created to simulate the various types of inks used in ancient books. So I think this is a familiar picture to you now. You've seen it before. Uh, scan the book. Uh, that it turned out that the red ink that was in these uh, fragments were the ones that at 70 kilovolts uh, on our CT scanner stood out. Uh, so we need to now inve start investigating how to what materials uh, these other inks are made up of and to identify which kilovoltages uh, will best interact with those materials to separate uh, them from the parchment. 
And then here was this something that stood out that actually wasn't even visible uh, to the eye uh, on this piece of parchment, which I think people, I might be wrong, but I think that some of the inks can seep into the parchment and be invisible to the eye and still visible to the x-ray. And then this was uh, a single slice uh, of, of this book binding where you can see there was a bit of, of text that was visible, but by again using similar techniques to what we use to unwrap and, and flatten the airway image, similar techniques to that have been used uh, to identify and flatten uh, a, a longer string of the text, which is visible over here. And then by creating samples of examples of the various inks that are used in the uh, books of interest and the, the fragments of interest, we can start exploring uh, with the, the photon counting CT scanner, the various energy bins and combination of energy bins that might allow us to extract out one ink versus a, a, a different ink. With that, I'll stop and leave room for questions.